It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity to name your sins to God if necessary. 1 John 1 9 states, If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege, opportunity, and freedom to assemble ourselves together that many people in the world do not have to assemble this portion of the word into our souls. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to put this together categorically in our uh, stream of consciousness so as to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in whose name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. Also pull out the uh, little card we have on the so simultaneous advance to the greatest oxymoron of all of history. The simultaneous advance to the greatest oxymoron of history. Today we have the opportunity as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to move to Pleroma, maximum glorification of God. And that means we will have maximum impact on our nation, on your state, on your family. And through that maximum impact, you will be able to be a blessing by association in which we may be shielded, shielded from the attack of terrorism and everything else that Satan wishes to throw upon this nation. So 1 John 2, 15 through 18 actually explains the motivation of the love for the cosmos, which you have on your sheet, your small sheet there. Does no one have one of these? The simultaneous advance to the greatest oxymoron of history. Maybe some people took it earlier. But this is the simultaneous advance to the greatest oxymoron of history. And what we have at the bottom of this sheet is something called matayotes. That is the vacuum in the stream of consciousness. The vacuum in the stream of consciousness. And that sucks in the doctrine of demons. Now what is your motivation? To suck in the doctrine of demons. To suck in that which is not part of the word of God. You know when you look around and when you uh, look at our country today and you see all the believers, none of them have any interest in what this has to say. The Bible and you could uh, flip through the, all these pages and say, don't you want to know what this is all about? Oh, yes, I do. I want to know. I learn it every Sunday. All of this every Sunday, you'll forget it by the next Sunday. And whatever you're learning is pathetic anyway. We have a lot of false teachers today who will suck you into the cosmic system. Why? They don't know what this says. They have no clue what the Bible says. They do not know how to rightly divide the word of truth, meaning they don't know dispensations. And there's a dispensation here. There's a dispensation here. There's a dispensation throughout. There are many dispensations which we've studied. So they don't rightly divide the word of truth, and many people don't even know what dispensation is. Why not? Because they have a pastor that wants to scratch their back and pass around a lot. Uh, pass around a, a donation plate so they can give a lot of money. He wants to make them feel good. Well, this is no feel-good religion. The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Does that sound feel good to you? Piercing! Even to the dividing asunder, the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. Joints and the marrow. And is a critic. There you go. This, the Bible, the Word of God, is a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Nobody likes to hear that, but that's what the Bible is. So I'm not here to make you feel good. If anything, you might walk away feeling very, very bad 
or you might listen to an mp3 and walk away feeling very sad and bad. There's a reason for it. It's not about feelings. It's about what the Word of God has to say. So there is a motivation, therefore, for you to love the world, which is cosmos. My cat's name is Gizmo, not Cosmos. Some people have mixed that up. But we have love for Cosmos. Maybe I should just call him Cosmos, because he sure does act like it sometimes. Let me show you the scratch on my leg. Cosmic system right there, buddy. <laughs> love for Cosmos. No, he's still Gizmo, little fella. Love for Cosmos. That's your motivation. Now on the bottom, Mataiotes. Now on your other handout that you have, on the simultaneous advance to the high ground that you may have or may not have, on the bottom there's the mentorship of God the Holy Spirit. That means you are filled with God the Holy Spirit. Then, you're filled with the Spirit. Your motivation to learn Bible doctrine is your reciprocal love for God. We love... Because God first loved us. That's reciprocal. God loved us first. Then we reciprocate. All of you know the great Shakespeare story about love. My brain just uh, shut down. Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. And Romeo started out thinking that Juliet didn't love him at all. You know what he had? Unreciprocal love. Not It was not reciprocal. You know what he did? He got depressed. Romeo, in the story. I studied in high school. And I remember this part of it. He was depressed because he loved this girl, but he thought this girl did not love him. So that's not reciprocal. Now God loves you. That doesn't mean you'll love God. And that makes it not reciprocal. And in the Bible, there are many passages that state our God is a jealous God. Meaning, once you've believed in Christ, you better make Bible doctrine number one or your life will be miserable. Because our God is a jealous God. Anthropopathism, of course. God can't be jealous. It's a sin. But that's a way for us to understand that God wants our love. He, desire, he desires our love. Just as Romeo desired the love of Juliet. God desires our love. And how do you give him that love? Filling of the Holy Spirit at the bottom, of course, mentorship. Then the two column advance. Reciprocate. God, we love God. Why? Because we because he first loved us. So we must reciprocate toward God. We must respond to God. Shakespeare understood a little bit about this. He understood a lot about man and woman relationship. And he understood that the man was the initiator and the woman was the responder. And Juliet responded. Your motivation is your response to God's love. Just as Juliet's motivation later for Romeo became a response. And it was a response to Romeo's love. But at first, when the story first gets started, poor old Romeo has a hard time because he thinks it's not reciprocal. And he becomes jealous in everything else. He sees her dancing with someone else. He becomes jealous. Now that's sin in human terms. But when it says God is jealous of us, that's not sin. God cannot sin. It's just a way of Him communicating to us that He desires our love more than we know. So we must have a reciprocal love for God and that should be our motivation to advance to the high ground. And that motivation, in turn, helps the other column. It's a double column advance. Two columns. And our motivation helps the other column learn doctrine. 
Because the only way we can come to love God is to know God, and the only way to know God is to know His doctrine. So it is our love for God that motivates us to have a knowledge for doctrine. When we're filled with the Spirit and take this two-column advance, we will advance to maximum glorification of God. Play Roma eventually. It takes a long time to get to play Roma. But at least we will... Uh, many of us may get to a tactical victory and that is a personal sense of destiny a personal sense of destiny that is the tactical victory you know why you're on the earth you know why you're alive there's only one reason to glorify God not to be a stumbling block to others but to glorify God not to be a gossip not to malign not to try to cause trouble among brethren. We are all on the same team and no one seems to understand it. And how does it work on a team? There is a coach. Authority! And he tells the team what to do. And then there are people under the coach. Quarterback. Administration. You know what he does? Well, in a good football team, some stupid football teams allow the quarterback to go ahead and make the decision, and that's stupid. That's not following protocol. Protocol is, coach has studied it all out. He knows what to do. So they have these little wire pieces or whatever today, and the coach calls out the play to the quarterback and says, quarterback, do this. So quarterback is administration, and quarterback does, if he can, exactly what the coach says and if the team is working well it will be a well coordinated play and the quarterback as administration will throw it to somebody else the runner what's that called I don't know much about football but they just throw it to somebody running in the outfield the receiver and the receiver will receive the ball and it all starts where with the coach and yes, it takes a team. Somebody tried to chew me out telling me it takes a team. You can't do this and that. You don't have a team unless a team respects authority. And there have been good coaches who have looked at good, talented players. But because they had a problem with authority, they have thrown them off the team in a hurry. Because they were maladjusted to authority. And no matter how much talent they had, as long as they were maladjusted to authority, they would never make it. All you have to do is watch that uh, the new movie that's out on... Um, it's on hockey, in which the United States players win against the uh, Russians. Go ahead and say it out loud. Miracle. Miracle. The movie is called Miracle. And they said it was a miracle because we beat the Russians at hockey in 1980. It's not a miracle, really. It's just good coaching. And a good coach with good authority. And when somebody got out of line and thought they knew something the coach didn't and was going to go against his authority, out they went. Sometimes they would come back, repent, as it were. Well, that's fine, as long as they know who the authority is. And the same goes for football or any team organization. There is authority. Where there are two or more people in an organization, there's authority. Marriage, two people, authority, husband, period. And if women have problems with the authority of their husband, they're going to have problems in all of life, at work and everywhere else. And if a man has a problem with authority, he's going to have problems all his life. He's going to be maladjusted to life. You have to have respect for authority. And Juliet responded to Romeo. And she responded to Romeo as an authority. And that's how it comes out in that uh, wonderful uh, tragedy, I guess they would call it. But you start at a tactical, tactical victory with a personal sense of destiny. Then you move to a strategic victory, occupation with Christ. That's when you've made it. You're occupied with Christ, not circumstances. No longer do circumstances depress you. How can they? You're occupied with Christ. If you're depressed, 
Apostle Paul himself became depressed, by the way. Well, let me not say depressed, because depression is a different thing totally. It's totally the guy. If you're filled with anxiety, that's different. That's not depression. Anxiety can make you depressed. But some people can be depressed and have no anxiety. It can happen. Sometimes it's absolutely chemical. The Apostle Paul went through depression at one point, and it was uh, chemical for him. He was just simply depressed, and he began to weep a lot. Even the Bible records it. He began, He got weepy. And he said, why aren't these people listening to me? And he thought in these terms, but and he said, these people are following Christ. Even or These people are following Satan. And the verse says, even weeping, he said, these people are following Satan. And there's a good weeping and a bad weeping, but I want to tell you as human beings, we're all going to get depressed, and that's not necessarily sin. Colonel's taught this too. This isn't from my mouth only. Just, just so you know, there's a difference. But let's move to anxiety. If you're anxiety-ridden, you're not using doctrine. If you're worried about this, that, and the other, if right now you're thinking about something else instead of doctrine, because you're anxiety-ridden, you're not going to make it. Doesn't matter. God will provide. He always has, hasn't he? You're here, so he has. Not only we're here, but we're here as big people, so he's definitely provided. Nobody would like that, did they? But we're all here as big people. God has provided. Do you get it? You don't get it? We're here as... Maybe. Okay. Never mind. We're here anyway, so God's provided. Compared to the Ethiopians, we're here as big people. <laughs> and now you got it. So, reciprocal love is where you start. And that's your love for God and your motivation to know God. As a result, you eventuate in having a personal sense of destiny, maximum glorification of God, occupation with Christ, and you advance to the high ground. This is for very few believers, especially in these United States today. Why? Arrogance. Love for the cosmos. Remember in the composites of Satan... He had relative righteousness. He was deceitful, very deceitful. I know people just like Satan. Extraordinarily deceitful. Unbelievable how deceitful they are. And why do they do it? In order to hurt someone else. Why? There are some people in life you'll run into and the only happiness they ever receive is if they think they make someone else unhappy. Don't try it with me. I'm a happy SOB. You ain't going to change it. Because doctrine. So, relative righteousness is where we have... And then deception is part of his composites. Violence. He likes to get involved in violence. How many believers like to do that? A lot. Violence, but they don't really think about violence. These people that get into violence, they'll beat up each other and they'll talk tough. But when it comes to something that they would never do, maybe they say to themselves, I would never ever commit adultery or fornication. And they may be right, that might be their area of strength. And maybe they never ever would, yet they're violent people. You know what they think? Nothing of it. Just as Satan thinks nothing of his violence. They don't think anything of it. And they say, I'm righteous. Well, I've never committed adultery. I'm a good father, even though you display violence in front of your children. No, you're not a good father. You're an SOB. Because you're involved in Satan's system of deception and violence. Also part of his composites include super genius, which I have not expounded on very much, but that has to do with the fact that some people use doctrine as an intellectual crutch. You know, some people only start listening to tapes because it's an, a new thing, 
a new intellectual thing that they've never had before. And they think of themselves as in terms of intellectuals. And so they listen to doctrine for a while and then they say, I'm bored with it. Let me go to something else intellectual. And through your mind, you're probably thinking of all types of different people. And some of you might be thinking of one person. Apply it to yourself. And there are a lot of people I know, not just one, a lot of people I know who get involved in intellectual arrogance. That's part of the super genius composite. Intellectual arrogance. And uh, oftentimes in intellectual arrogance, they will try to combine the doctrine they learn with atheism. Or they will try to combine the doctrine they learn with Buddhism. Well, they, they think they're intellectual in doing so. Open-minded is what they call it today. It's arrogant intellectualism. Oh, you're closed-minded. Uh, you'll talk to somebody, oh, you're closed-minded about those religions. you telling me in all those religions they're all going to hell? Yes! Oh, well, you're closed-minded then. Meaning what? You're not intellectual enough to understand is what they're saying. And then all you have to do is respond with no name under heaven given among men by which man can be saved except Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And instead of arguing with them, give them the gospel. They will not believe usually because they're involved in an arrogance called intellectual arrogance. And if they've already believed, they're in deep anyway. And you might be shocked, but uh, one day we'll get to heaven and we might realize we witnessed to some people who are already saved. They just got involved in some intellectual arrogance, so you couldn't distinguish between them and someone else. And there are believers who become atheists, people who believed in Christ and then say, now nah, I don't believe it anymore. They're still saved, as per Second Timothy. As per the Bible, they're still saved. But they go in for this other junk. Well, that's intellectual arrogance as part of Satan's composite Super genius? Well, they want to be thought of as super genius, too. You see how we follow human beings in our old sin nature. How we follow every composite of Satan unless we go into the spiritual life. And now you see why Satan hates us when we go into the spiritual life because we move out of his system. And believe me, his system hates us. Oh, he might not know you personally, but his system hates you. And people involved in his system will hate you, despise you, run you into the ground, try to destroy you, laugh while they see you fall. They want to see you fall. They want to see you have problems. Why? They're on the other side. Now again, Satan might not know you personally, but his system is so intricate that his system hates you. Satan don't have to know you for you to get into all types of uh, antagonism from others. His system hates you. His system despises this church. I seriously doubt Satan knows anything about little bitty church right here. A.E. Lewis Ministries. I... Seriously, I'm I'm th I'm telling you, 99.99999% sure. I'm seriously doubt as busy as he is, he knows anything about this little bitty place in Anderson, and I guarantee you, he's not too concerned about it. Why? He's got a system. He's got a system. He's not too concerned about me because I'm no Job. So he's got a system, and his system doesn't like it so his system attacks what is his system anti-authority therefore we go back to what I was talking about the coach having authority over the team and just like the fellow told me you talk about how you have a team but you don't care about your team wrong I care about the team enough to do what is necessary to make sure the team is protected just like a good coach will throw out certain people who are arrogant, a good pastor will throw out people who are arrogant. And they cannot function in terms of a team. We're on the same team. But 
When you're on the same team and you challenge the coach, you're challenging authority. And that coach has every right to discipline and remove. And the pastor has every right to discipline and remove. With the hope that they'll straighten out. Not out of bitterness, but with the hope that they'll straighten out and begin to understand what authority is all about. Sometimes people have to be shocked into it. Some people, some people get so offended by the shocking part of it, they never make it. So if you don't do this, this reciprocal love for God and learning the knowledge of doctrine, and if you don't move to an occupation of Christ, you'll do the other thing. You'll go on the simultaneous advance to the greatest oxymoron of history, shame in a resurrection body. And that starts with Mateotes. So you... This is where we begin with 1 John 2, 15, where we started. It wasn't just a random verse. Here we go. 1 John 3, or 1 John 2, 15. 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world. That's cosmos, the cosmic system. Do not love the cosmic system. Now on your sheet you'll see here, love for cosmos. Well, that's your motivation. What, are, what is a person's motivation to suck in the doctrine of demons? They love the cosmic system. And when you love the cosmic system, you open up Mateotes and you suck in the doctrine of demons. And you make a simultaneous advance to loser. Or you could call it simultaneous reverse or simultaneous retrogression. Retrogression to the greatest oxymoron of history. But you're advancing though. What are you advancing in? Satan's system. And when you advance in Satan's system, Satan has little carrots to hand out. You know what they are? little things that you think make you happy and your life becomes like this when you move into Satan's system your life becomes like this I try to make it as dramatic as possible because I don't think anybody's ever made a roller coaster like this they should because that's what people like and what do people like? Well, in the cosmic system, there is no stability. You see, in the uh, divine dinosphere, if you have plus H sharing the happiness of God, you're up here in the atmosphere. That's where you are, sharing happiness of God. That's your roller coaster, but it don't go up and down. And a lot of believers look at that and say, that's boring. It's all the same all the time. It's always happiness. Oh, that's boring. I want to get into something. Let me get into something. I need to argue with somebody. I don't want to share the happiness of God. I want to argue. I want to fight. So they do. Argue and fight. And then what? Makeup session. You know, that's the stupidest thing ever, and I've heard people say it, and I, it's true in the cosmic system. And I've heard people say it before. Well, me and my husband, we fight. And the wife would say, but I don't mind it uh, too bad because the makeup session is wonderful. Fighting. Makeup session. You're still in the cosmos. You're way up here now. Makeup session. Then what? Bam! Back down. The worst domestic fights occur after sex. Not during. Sometimes before, but definitely after. And that goes for that goes for anything. You're in the cosmic system, you're functioning off your body, really. It's all your body, the old sin nature, the flesh. And that's how your body functions. So you're way up here, now you crash. Now you're unhappy. Now you're happy. Now you're unhappy. Now you're happy. And you know what it all depends on? Circumstances. Okay, I gave one example. This was sex here. 
going to the climax of sex, I'm happy. Crash. Argument. I won the lottery. Yay! Happy, happy, happy. Oh, not just the lottery. This time you won the big shebang. 300 million. 300 million dollars right here. Guess what? I think we'd all do this. Whoop! All right! If you had just pulled out your uh, lottery ticket and you saw you won, would you be sitting here? Would I be standing here? Think about it. Cosmic system. Oh, that's why I'm so happy now. You got more than that! Way more! And it would make you happy. Pseudo-happiness. Then guess what? <laughs> Crash. What goes up must come down. And it's the same in the cosmic system. And guess what? Your marriage? You argue just as much, if not more, with the 300 million. You know why? Now you start arguing, what do we spend it on? And you'll be arguing just as if uh, you did with your $30,000. Oh yeah? I want to spend it on this. Oh, that's stupid! I want an airport! I want a runway! No, that's stupid! I want a house on the ocean! Nah, I want to live in the mountains. Well, we can do both. Oh, hell no. You're not spending all my money. Etc. And believe me, you can lose $300 million in a heartbeat. People have done it. Why? Because they get in these arguments. And then, well, we got enough to do both. I'll buy my island. I'll buy my mountain with an airport. And then you got no more money. Crash. Or you may keep the money. You may invest it right. You're still going to have that crash. You think Bill Gates is any more happier than we are? You're a fool if you do. And then up again. Oh, relationships. Maybe you have a great social life. See this roller coaster? What do you do on a roller coaster? Anticipation. Uh, <coughs> ah! And what happens at the end of the roller coaster? <coughs> Vomit. What happens at the end of the cosmic system roller coaster? You don't vomit. Jesus Christ vomits you out of his mouth. He's sick of you doing this. Up and down and up and down. Oh, now I got a wonderful social life. I'm so happy with the parties and all that I have. And then someone treats you bad at a party. Crash. Oh, they did me wrong. And now you talk about that for about a year. Some people have done that. I've had people bring up stuff that I've done that wasn't even really wrong, but they thought it was. They brought it up five years later. Remember when you did so-and-so? Are you still really interested in that? You're crazy. You are psycho. You're psycho. If you bring up something that somebody did five years ago, you're psychotic. And there are people like that. Especially in marriage. And uh, something happened five years ago, ten years ago, thirty years ago. It's over. Forget it. You can't change the past. Then up you go again. Oh, what else will make you happy now? Well, I don't know. Uh, well, there's so many different things that make certain... Everyone else, everyone else has a different personality, but it's all the same system. Well, your social life, money, sex, job. Uh, job, that's a good one. Job. Some people feel if they lose the job, boom, unhappy. Well, even if they have the job. You see, it don't matter what kind of job you have. Glad you said job, because it, it does not, doesn't, correct English, doesn't matter what kind of job you have. I'm speaking basically to all of you, but it's good to teach basic stuff. Doesn't matter what kind of job you have. If you're an actress or an actor, and let's say your salary is, uh, well, like, well, we watched the movie The Weatherman last night, and he went and got a job, and at the end of the movie, 
he made, he found a job in which he made, was going to make $1.2 million. That's what happened at the end of the movie. But what was his life like through the whole movie? Terrible! Oh, he started out making, I believe it was 200000 plus some uh, quirks. And then the 1.2 million, not quirks, but the perks. He started out with 200000 with some perks. Then he got a job, 1.2 million with some perks. And he wasn't any happier with the pay raise or anything else. Well, he went from Chicago to New York City, and that wouldn't make anyone happy anyway, either city. But the fact is, his life was like this. Even though he had a wonderful job, I'd love that job, a meteorologist. That's one, I'd, man, that, that was my one of my dreams. Meteorologist, weatherman, that'd be wonderful. Get to talk about the thing that I love. But now I get to talk the thing about, about the thing I love most. Without all that, of course. <laughs> but anyway, don't all of you send your money at once. I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> but the fact is, he got this $1.2 million job, and he was unhappy, unhappy, unhappy. Now, sometimes he would get happy in the movie. Now, he would be out with his daughter and give her some clothes. Well, that was stimulating. He was able to buy her a lot of clothes because he had the money to do so. And at school they were making fun of her. I won't tell you about what. You'll have to watch the movie. It's not proper. But they were making fun of her about something specific. And so her dad said, All right, I'm going to dress you up, make you look nice. Nobody will make fun of you anymore. And it's true. He made her look nice. And he was very happy after he did that. You know why? He thought he'd done something great. He took his daughter out, bought her all these wonderful clothes, and she was happy and he was happy. But then, his father, who is now comes up with bad news, I'm dying, his father was dying, and his son had gotten in trouble with some uh, pervert. It wasn't the son's fault, but the pervert's fault. And he had gotten in trouble, so he went from happy to sad in one second. And the daughter comes out with a smile on her face, and then both the grandfather and father are looking miserable. She doesn't know what's going on. Happy to unhappy. Two seconds. No stability! Why not? No spiritual life. Happiness to most people, including believers, depend on happenings. My daughter being made fun of, that makes me unhappy. My daughter, I got her new clothes, and she won't be made fun of anymore. I'm happy. My son's in trouble, unhappy. I got a job making 1.2 million. Ooh, I'm happy. My wife divorces me. Ooh, I'm unhappy. And she did. As soon as he got the job of 1.2 million, she says, sorry, I'm marrying somebody else. That's not the way it happened in real life. But it happened in the movie. It could happen in real life. So he said, I'm unhappy. Man about to be a millionaire. Unhappy! Money won't make you happy. People will not make you happy. Children will not make you happy. Bottle Akron will make you happy! And that's it! That's all you have! Maybe you're a young person. What will make you happy? Head cheerleader. I'm happy I'm head cheerleader. Head cheerleader gets a lot of attention. Head cheerleader gets a lot of attention from both girls and boys. Head cheerleader goes to party. Very popular. Head cheerleader gets on drugs, gets on alcohol, gets knocked up. Happy? Unhappy. So Satan's system does have a pseudo-happiness, but it's like this. Happy, happy, happy. Most of it unhappy, unhappy, unhappy. And the more you get involved in it, the more you realize you end up as a bitter old person. Always unhappy. Because when you're a bitter old person, you're not able to walk anymore or do anything. You lose those stimulations of the old sin nature. And it is a stimulation. 
And some people regard sex in adultery as being more pleasurable than sex in marriage. Well, that's the cosmic system for you. I'm not saying it wouldn't be more pleasurable. I'm saying it's the cosmic system. Maybe it would be. But that's the cosmic system. That's not God's system. And God's system doesn't function on what you want for pleasure. It doesn't function on what you need as in terms of what you want, not need, a big difference. What you want in terms of money. God's system functions on whether you're in His system or not and whether you're functioning on the team. And believe me, when you function on the team, you're functioning on the winner team. And your life may never mean... You might be a janitor all your life and end up in Pleroma where you've done something that uh, is phenomenal and will be recognized for eternity, not for little blips here and there through your life. And a lot of people think that happiness comes through uh, approbation lust. That's a big one. A lot of people think like that. Look at Marilyn Monroe. She thought, and this is the way she was, just in terms of history and knowing about her, she thought approbation lust was it. That's how you be happy. She lived a short life. She hobnobbed with a president. That's all I'll say about that. But she lived a short life. An unhappy one, too, by the way. She was unstable. And you too in the cosmic system will be unstable. You will be moody. M-O-O-D-Y. Moody. That's the cosmic system. Best way to know if someone's in the cosmic system, they're moody. Happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. Like a roller coaster. But if you're in the divine dinosphere, once you grow up, I'm not... What, when you first start to grow up, you're still going to have that happy, sad, happy, sad type thing going on, even in spiritual childhood, because most of the time in spiritual childhood, you don't spend it in uh, spirituality. But once you grow in grace, the more time you spend in spirituality, the more time you spend in spirituality, the less you rely on the happy, sad of the cosmic system. And you move toward what's called plus H, sharing the happiness of God. And then you're always happy. You will sin. And you may have moments of a depression. That's normal. And uh, you'll sin and then you'll rebound and get back with it. And even in spiritual maturity, you might have depression. But the thing about that is, the Apostle Paul's depression, for example... Apostle Paul only reached spiritual maturity, but he was tested and tested and tested and tested and tested. Tested so much it kind of, well, it didn't irritate him. It just, after a while, it gets old. So he's, he was up here, plus eight, sharing the happiness of God. And then at some point he was tested and tested so much, and people would write back from all the church that he, churches that he had built up. He started out with nothing took him about 15 years to even get started. But once he got started and churches started springing up around him everywhere. And then these churches would write back and they would have squabbles and they would have fights and they would act like Jerry Springer type nuts and idiots. It depressed him. So, but in, in something about Paul, he didn't do this. He just did this. Well, that he was sharing the happiness of God in his depression it just wasn't here it was here but it's still above the cosmic system down here where everybody's going woo 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 on their roller coaster he did have depression he did weep he wept a lot you would probably look at him and say he must be holy roller he weeps so much no, his weeping was legitimate weeping. And he would weep over his churches. And it was depressing. But even, the Apostle Paul, even in his depression, way better off than all the people in the cosmic system, for sure. And he would come out of it. 
He taught uh, Timothy how to come out of it. How did he teach Timothy to come out of it? Stop drinking only water. Drink a little, a little, little wine for thy stomach's sake. In the, the Old Testament, it also talks about wine as a type of medication for depression. Now there's different things. And a lot of people get against medication because they don't understand it. And they just don't uh, understand how uh, they say to themselves, well, doctrine's the whole answer. What do you need this for and what do you need that for? Well, why did Timothy need a little wine for his stomach's sake? Some medication. That's how Paul looked at it. And Paul himself drank wine as a medication. A little bit. Now, Paul and Timothy were not alcoholics. Uh, just like uh, some people get addicted to uh, certain medicines. All kinds of medicine. Let me, I'm trying to think of some. Xanax, you can get addicted to that. You can get addicted to, uh, what is it? Valium. You can get addicted to Valium. You can get addicted to Ativan. All, these are all medicines today used to calm people down. But they didn't have that in the Old Testament or at the time when Paul wrote. What did they have? A little wine. A little wine. And Paul drank a little wine. And Timothy drank a little wine as a medicine for his stomach's sake. There you go. And what was wrong with it? His stomach was tore up because the church was about to revolt. So his stomach got tore up over that. He said, all these women are coming out. I don't know what to do. And he was all nervous. And when he would get up to speak, he would be nervous because he would look out at the people and he knew that certain women were looking at him with hatred. And when he got up to speak, he would be all nervous. And Paul noticed all that and said, Timothy, a little wine for your stomach's sake. A little medicine. So don't be against medicine at all. And today they have far greater medicine than what wine would do. Wine doesn't last very long. And then there's always the uh, side effects to any medicine, including wine. And, but today we have even better things that a doctor will prescribe to certain people for depression. And I tell you now, there's nothing wrong with it. There is something wrong with addiction to medicine just as there is to alcohol. But there are certain medicines today that aren't addictive whatsoever, but they do help with depression. And there's nothing wrong with it if you're on it. Nothing shameful about it. Doesn't mean you failed in any way. Just as Timothy did not fail... When Paul said, drink a little wine. It's just a bit of medicine that God put on the earth for us. He didn't put marijuana on the earth for us, though. Don't get it. Nah. -uh. Whoever's watching in the, into marijuana, forget it. That's illegal. It should be. Definitely should be illegal. And he said, what about medical marijuana? That's only in California. If you live out there, you're a weirdo anyway and you won't get anything out of this. I'm just joking. If you're in California and you're listening, you're a good fella. <laughs> it's time to move to South Carolina and just play it. But anyway, that's enough for tonight. But just to show you that Satan does have an opposite system. And his system is uh, one that does offer some happiness in happenings. God's system does not offer happiness and happenings except one. And that is what happened on the cross and how we can be occupied with what happened to Jesus Christ on the cross and how we can be occupied with Jesus Christ himself and the unique spiritual life he lived and we can live the same one. And don't think for a moment that Jesus Christ himself and his humanity did not become depressed. He did. He wept. Jesus wept. It's not the shortest verse in the Bible, by the way. That's somewhere else. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's not Jesus wept. Not in the original Greek, anyway. In the English, it is, the way it's been uh, put out in the English. But he wept, and he wept over his client nation. That's a source of depression. When you know your nation's going under, that's depressing. I was depressed for probably three months after 9-11, to be honest with you. That's a normal-type depression. 
And uh, Jesus Christ was depressed over Jerusalem. And he wept over Jerusalem. And Jesus uh, Christ wept at a funeral. Nothing wrong with that. And those are normal things. But he, he, he did not weep constantly. And he did not make an issue out of himself. And he never made an issue out of self-pity. In other words, people feel sorry for me. When Jesus wept, he often did it alone. Away from people. He didn't want people to feel sorry for him. And so this is, uh, this is the way it is as living. This is part of living. And that's why God has promised us that when we die, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. Just because you live the spiritual life, you're still going to have sorrow. You're going to have pain. No more sorrow, no more pain, you're going to have tears. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears. The old things have passed away. Right now we're living in the old things and we're going to have sorrow and we're going to have tears and we're going to have pain. But guess what we have to combat all of that? The unique spiritual life. And a little wine for thy stomach's sake for some people. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to what... Uh, all of these things mean in relation to either being filled with the Spirit or living in the cosmic system. And we can choose either way. But as for us, and as for me and my household, may we serve the Lord. In whose name we ask it, Amen.